I think one of the key takeaways from these results is going to be these enormous beats on trading revenue, essentially a winning streak that hasn't quite quit yet. I think it's fair to also assume that a lot of this is coming off simply the elevated volatility that we've seen. But Shanali, I'm looking at a VIX handle of 21, which is pretty close to our post-pandemic normal. What happens when the volatility goes away? And we've talked about this, that volatility could have been very stifling, but there are certain businesses that really blew through the roof here. We have Goldman Sachs, which posted not just a beat, but a significant significant rise in fixed income trading currencies commodities helped by that volatile rates and commodities environment. We also saw Morgan Stanley fall just in line about where they were last year. That's more than $2.9 billion for Morgan Stanley in FIC trading revenues, which is higher and higher than the historical that we've seen from Morgan Stanley before, really uh, inking more than $2 billion there. Even Citigroup, even with a slight decline in the FIC business, you did have them beat expectations. And equities also, you had equities. Morgan Stanley taking the lead again here with more than $3 billion, more than three, almost $3.2 billion worth of equity trading revenue in a very tough environment, Critty. Um, these banks used to make a lot of money in Russia. They're not going to make that money yeah. going forward. Shinali, what have we learned about the exit from the Russian market? Yeah, this is a great question because we're finally seeing how these losses are being contained. Citigroup, we knew, was the most exposed here, and we know now that their exposure has dropped by about $2 billion to about $7.8 billion, Guy. And they still have loans, they still have a counterparty exposure and derivatives, but with that said, it is much more contained, and we know that it's about a $1 billion worth of Russia exposure alone when it comes to Citigroup's uh, provisioning here. Another nine billion dollar uh, 900 million dollars I'm sorry uh, when it pertains to other risks surrounding the uncertainties of the uh, Ukrainian invasion here Shelly there's a massive debate are we in it for a recession is that on the horizon or are we simply in a slowing growth demand destruction kind of environment where do the banks stand on that we know Jamie Dimon has been extremely vocal saying the consumer is fine the economy is fine where do the rest of the banks say not only do you have Jamie Dimon saying that the risk is still very low of the recession or you know rather his CFO saying that you also have David Solomon today really starting off his call here with the list of risks one of them and he mentioned a couple times at the beginning of this call this ex risk of accelerating deglobalization here. And he said that plus the inflation impact, the risk of rising rates, all of this could be uh, meaningful, is what he said for markets. With that said, the backlogs, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, are still robust, are still very stable. And it seems yeah. here from the bankers that it, clients are simply prolonging activity here in equity, debt, and M&A markets. And you saw that a little bit today, guys, from that Morgan, uh, Elon Musk deal. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. So let's talk about the Outlook 4 advisory. What is it? It's, it's Musk represented by Morgan Stanley, Goldman's representing Twitter. Like, what are they talking about aside from that in terms of the Outlook 4 advisory? It clearly is slowing down. We were talking to Laurie Calvacina a little bit earlier on. She was saying that the one thing that, that they're getting as they screen all the earnings calls is that the, the talk of M&A has gone down and gone down dramatically. I think there's two things to remember here, Guy, and it's that as equity vol uh, volatility, as it stabilizes a little bit, and if valuations are suppressed, that gives some opportunity for private equity to start showing up in a bigger way and deploying capital after record fundraising. The other thing here is that you see billionaire-led deals. You see it in the Benettons. You see it in Elon Musk. Elon Musk, by the way, has counted Morgan Stanley as a banker before. They have hired them to do many a jumbo loan for Elon Musk's mortgages here. So you see see here the banks as they're catering to their wealthy individuals, as they're catering to their corporate clients, they are finding chances for big deals in between. Shali, very quickly, you mentioned fundraising in particular. We talked about the advisory business. Talk to us about the ECM, DCM businesses. Well, the ECM, that IPO activity was a record last year, and it really started to fall off at the beginning of this year. Again, it's one thing for the investors really to say that this is something where they're prolonging equity raising activity. But the M&A, Goldman still, I, I have to say, Goldman Sachs still bought in more than a billion dollars worth of advisory fees alone. And Morgan Stanley saw their fees more than double in the advisory business. So underwriting is really what's going to have to come back in a bigger way here.